All right, now for the second half of our life through time discussion. Um, last time we were talking about the Big Bang, the Solar Nebula Hypothesis, and we talked about the Precambrian Eon. For the second half, we're going to start in the Phanerozoic Eon. Remember, that is the second eon of geologic time. Um, and this is where the interesting things with life began. So remember that the Phanerozoic Eon is broken into three eras, the Paleozoic, the Mesozoic, and the Cenozoic. So we're going to start in the early Phanerozoic in the early Paleozoic era. Now as we go through this journey, I'm going to let you know where we are in geologic time, but I do not expect you to memorize these dates. Okay, just letting you know relative to everything where we are in Earth's history. So the early Paleozoic is this time that stretches from 542 million years ago to about 444. Now this is known as the age of the invertebrates. This is the dominant life at this time. An invertebrate is an animal or an organism without a backbone. So today, if we look at some common invertebrates, uh, clams, mussels, uh, squid, jellyfish, these would all be classified as invertebrate organisms. So this is the dominant life at this time. Now, if you're wondering why we draw the boundary where we do between the Precambrian Eon and the Phanerozoic Eon, it's because at the very beginning of the Phanerozoic Eon, we get a great diversification of eukaryotic life. Remember we talked about, when we talked about evolution, we called this an evolutionary radiation, where you have an expansion of a species or a group of species over a relatively short period of time. Now this evolutionary radiation is so important we give it a name. It's called the Cambrian Explosion. The Cambrian is the first period in the Paleozoic era in the Phanerozoic Eon. Now during this time we are going to see all life is going to be confined to the oceans. So it's going to be a while tens of millions of years before life eventually colonized land. Now if you take a look at your right hand side you'll notice that top picture uh, is a fossil of what are called brachiopods. They are distant relatives to mussels and clams today. They were fairly common and abundant during the early Paleozoic. The bottom picture is of a very common animal at this time called the trilobite. Now I know what you're thinking, they look like, oh, they're insects. Well, no, actually they're more closely related to arthropods like lobsters and crabs than they are to insects. They're very dominant at this time as well. Now here is this Cambrian explosion, this evolutionary radiation. And I want you to pay particular attention to this right here. Okay, This is biodiversity. This is the number of genuses of complex multicellular eukaryotic life. Notice this dark black line. Here's the boundary, ladies and gentlemen. So Precambrian on this side, Phanerozoic on this side. And you'll notice that when we start the Phanerozoic, we have maybe 20 to 30 genuses of complex life. But within about a 20 million year period, from here to here, we go from about 20 to over 1,200. This is the definition of that evolutionary radiation. And this is why we draw the boundary the way where we do. Now, here are some fairly common organisms during this time. Um, this is Marella, or the lace crab. You'll notice that we do not have anything today that looks even <laughs> remotely like this. And you can actually see a fossilized remains here in the bottom right hand. Uh, here are our trilobites. Once again, very common, very abundant during this early Paleozoic era. Now, you'll notice the picture on the left. This is of an early species of trilobite, very simple in design. The ones on your right hand side, you'll notice, have spikes 
on their bodies. Paleontologists think that this was an evolutionary adaptation to predators. So as trilobites evolved, they evolved these defensive mechanisms. Now, what did they have to be scared of? Well, at this time, these are our top marine predators, our anomalocarids. Now, to give you an idea of size, from head to tail, probably um, ranging from anywhere between 6 to 8, maybe some species reach 10 feet in length. These are the tertiary consumers of their time. Top, top, top predators. Now, paleontologists think, if you take a look at these appendages at the very tips of their snout, paleontologists think that these appendages would grab a trilobite, prey, break them open, and eat out the good parts inside. So this is top of the food chain during this time. Now, it is also at this time that we see one of our earliest fishes. One of the first fossils was found in China, and so they got to name it. I don't even try. I have no idea how to correctly pronunciate that. But the reason I bring this up is this is the first fossil evidence of the first chordate. Remember, we've talked about that word before. A chordate is something with a nodal backbone. We're chordates, ladies and gentlemen. And so take a look at your pinky fingernail. That's about how big this guy was. But from this very, very small fish, all chordates, including us, are evolved. So say hello to your ancestors, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's move on to the Middle Paleozoic. Now this is the time that stretches from 444 to 359 million years ago. Once again, I don't expect you to memorize those dates. I simply want to let you know where we are in our journey. Now, this time period is known as the Age of Fishes. Why? Well, guess what the dominant life was. That's right, fish. Now, we also at this time will see the appearance of some modern species that are still with us today, including fish, flightless insects like spiders, and sharks. They get their start back in the Middle Paleozoic. We also see the appearance of our first big, large tertiary consumers, the placoderms, which means armored fish. Now, if you take a look here, this bottom picture, here's a placoderm, guys. And I know what you're thinking, oh, that's a shark. Nope, that's a fish, ladies and gentlemen. Now, once again, some of the larger species from head to tail probably reach 20 feet in length. And as you notice, that over their heads, they evolved this bony armor plating, thus the term placoderm, which means armored fish. You can actually see a fossilized, or a fossil of one of these armor platings. They are top marine predators at this time. Now, in the, in the early to middle stages of the Middle Paleozoic, life is still confined to the oceans. We won't see life on land until the latter stages, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Now, here, once again, is an evolutionary radiation, guys. And so, here's where we are. Here's the early Paleozoic, the Cambrian and Ordovician. Here's where we are now, the Silurian and Devonian. This is the middle Paleozoic, and you'll notice you get this great diversification of fish. Now, some of these groups, like placoderms, they have their say, they're around for 20, 30, 40 million years, and then they go extinct. You'll notice, though, some modern species get their start way back here that are still with us today, including hagfish, lampreys, sharks, rays, even our ray fin fishes. These are the fish with the bones in their fins. Uh, and even lungfishes get their start here in the middle Paleozoic, thus why we call the Middle Paleozoic the Age of Fishes. Now, here is an artist's conception of what these Middle Paleozoic seas might have looked like. In addition to fish, we also get the appearance of modern day species like sponges, corals, even sea lilies. They all get their start back here as well. Now, this bottom picture here, these are nautiloids, guys. 
these are some distant ancestors to what will eventually become squids and octopi that we see today. Now, I want to point out this guy right here. I know he doesn't look like much, but eventually, after a lot more time, guys, this guy will evolve into an intermediate between fish and amphibians and crawl its way out of the oceans. But we'll save that for a little bit later. Now, I like to entitle this slide, Life is Ironic. What you see there, guys, is the larger placoderm about to eat one of these early sharks, okay? I know what you're thinking, oh, that's a shark about to eat a fish. Nope, that's a fish about to eat a shark. And so early on, sharks were very, very small, maybe a foot to at maximum three feet in length. And so as sharks have evolved, they've actually, some of them, evolved bigger bodies. Now, here we have our crinoids. This is an ancestor to uh, sea lilies that we see around today. You can actually see some beautiful fossils on the left-hand side. Very, very common in the middle Paleozoic seas. One of my favorite marine organisms at this time are Eurypterids. These are sea scorpions, ladies and gentlemen. Eventually, they will make their way out of the oceans and evolve into land scorpions that we see today. Now, at the middle to later stages of the Middle Paleozoic, we will see the first organisms make their way out of the oceans. And it was our vascular plants that were the first to adapt to a truly terrestrial environment. In order to do this, they had to have three evolutionary advantages, advantages. First, a rigid stalk. Think about plants that live in the water. They do not have to worry about the effects of gravity. The buoyancy of the water will hold them up. Well, now they're on land. And gravity's a bitch, ladies and gentlemen. You have to evolve something that helps you deal with that force. And so that's where that rigid stalk comes in. A root system, something to anchor the plants and also a way for the plants to absorb nutrients. And lastly, something called a vascular system. This is a, a plant's ability to gather nutrients through its root system. So plants absorb water, nutrients and elements through the soil. This is done through their vascular system. This is kind of akin to our circulatory system. Think about what our heart does. It pumps blood to all parts of our body. While a vascular system in a plant pumps water and nutrients to all parts of the plant. And you can see on the right hand side some early vascular plants. Now, vascular plants reproduced using something called spores. In order for a spore to take root, you have to be in a wet, swampy environment. So while these are the first organisms to colonize the land, they had to stay close to the water's edge. Okay? They needed that soil that was completely saturated. Otherwise, the spores wouldn't take root. So yes, these vascular plants are on land, but they were limited to coastal areas where that soil was either partly or fully saturated. It's gonna be tens of millions of years before the plants evolve something to help them cope with a much drier environment. And that's a new means of reproduction, the seed. Seeds don't need wet and swampy environments to take root. And so the first seed plants freed these early middle Paleozoic plants from these wet, swampy coastal environments. And so after these were evolved, the plants were able to move further inland into much drier environments. There is fossil evidence that in the later stages of the Middle Paleozoic, we get our first trees developing and our first forests show up. 
at the very later stages of the Middle Paleozoic. Now, this is going to be, uh, this is going to create an interesting situation. Okay, think about it. There's no animals on land yet, and so the plants have no predators. There's no herbivores to munch on them, and so. Remember a byproduct of photosynthesis, guys. All of these vascular plants, all of these trees are pumping out oxygen like crazy because there's nothing eating them. And so we think in the later stages of the Middle Paleozoic, oxygen levels reach their highest in geologic history, maybe somewhere between 35-36%. As opposed to today, to today, guys, oxygen levels are only at about 21%. So not quite double what the oxygen content was like. This is going to create a very interesting situation in some of our first terrestrial organisms. There's going to be a lot more oxygen available, which is going to create an interesting evolutionary adaptation. Now, here is an artist reconstruction of what one of those early Middle Paleozoic forests look like. Now, here is the oldest terrestrial organism that we have fossil evidence for. This is Ichthyostega. And I know what, at first glance, what you guys are saying. Oh, that's an amphibian. No, it's kind of an intermediate between lobe fin fishes and true amphibians. It's not a true fish and it's not a true amphibian. It's somewhere in between. Now you'll notice that if you look at the artist reconstruction, now instead of fins we're starting to see legs with digits develop. We also notice that the skeletal structure it becomes strengthened. Once again it has to cope with gravity. And so limbs and joints and muscles all strengthened in order to do this. Now, just like true amphibians today, if you've ever had a frog as a pet, you'll notice that they spend the majority of their time in water. They only rarely come out of water to feed, to mate, to do whatever. These were the same, probably acted the same way. So spent most of their time in the water, but could come out of water, maybe to avoid predators, maybe to lay eggs. There's a whole host of things that they could do, but they didn't stay on land long. Most amphibians need their skin to remain wet and moist. Probably Ichthyostega had the same constraints. But once again, the first terrestrial vertebrate, guys. So once again, Say hello to your ancestor. Now, later in the Middle Paleozoic, as animals now are on land, we will see the first appearance of our flightless insects. So relatives of scorpions, land scorpions, of centipedes, and of spiders they all get their start way back in the middle Paleozoic. Nothing flying, not yet. But here's the interesting thing. Remember we just talked about oxygen levels, guys, how they were much higher in the middle Paleozoic than they are today. Well, if you remember your high school biology class, most insects have an exoskeleton. Well, believe it or not, that exoskeleton allows oxygen to pass into the body and it then exhales the CO2 through cellular respiration. Well, since there were higher oxygen levels now, insects could maintain much bigger body types. So one of the first land scorpions was probably about the size of, let's say, a small German shepherd. Um, centipedes reached maybe 10 feet in length and maybe a full foot around. And spiders some of the earliest spiders were the size of a golden lab. Small golden lab, but still a golden lab. And so as our herbivores begin to munch on the plants, we will see oxygen levels slowly decline, which forces the insects to evolve smaller bodies.
through their evolutionary history. So some of the first flightless insects were big, but as time goes on, as those herbivores begin to eat those, that vegetation, oxygen levels decline and we see insects evolve smaller bodies. All right, let's move on to the late Paleozoic. This is the time that stretches from 359 to 251 million years ago, and this is known as the age of amphibians. Notice how life has changed through time, guys. Age of invertebrates, age of fishes, now age of amphibians. Now, these early amphibians are dominant during the late Paleozoic, but they will eventually evolve into some of the first reptiles at the very end of the late Paleozoic. If you'll notice this picture here, guys, here's a herd of some of these early amphibians, okay? Distant relatives to frogs and salamanders and toads and newts today. Here's one of these first reptiles, Dimetrodon. We're gonna talk about him a little while later. So, a herd of amphibians running from an early reptile. We also, at this time, see Pangaea come together. Remember we talked about Rodinia before, guys, the first supercontinent in the Precambrian. Well, Rodinia split apart, comes back together about 900 million years later in the form of Pangaea. At the very end of the late Paleozoic, we see the Earth's largest extinction event ever, called the Permian extinction event. And we'll talk about what we think caused it and what happened as a direct result of that extinction event. Now, during the late Paleozoic, in the first half, um, there was two periods called the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian. These are collectively called the Carboniferous. It is at this time where most of the Earth, as Pangaea is beginning to come together, where you had these massive swamps that you can see uh, in that picture below. Well, here's the interesting thing, guys. All of that plant material eventually dies, falls to the ground surface, is covered with sediment, and is slowly cooked and squeezed into coal. We'll talk about this later when we get to energy, but is these massive swamps in the Carboniferous that lead to our large coal deposits today. You'll also see we get the appearance of our first flying insects. Dragonflies are very common at this time, but oxygen levels are still hot. They're declining, but they're still higher today than, than they are today, so h larger forms than what we see uh, with current species. Now, just to give you an idea, here is one of these early dragonflies that had a wingspan of about two and a half feet. Now, I want to point out something. Remember we talked about the Linnaean system of classification, guys. Remember the binomial por por portion of that. Whenever we classify something, the first word, remember, this is the genus. The second word is the species. So here's one of those much larger late Paleozoic dragonflies. Now here is this time period's namesake, the amphibians. This is the only terrestrial vertebra vertebrates in the early part of this. Once again, they'll evolve into reptiles much, much later, towards the end of our Paleozoic. Now, this is a much more diverse group than what we see today. Today, we really only have four common groups of amphibians, guys, toads, frogs, newts, and salamanders. And that's it. This was a much more diverse group that ranged in size. Some were small, like we would see uh, maybe a modern frog today, but some reached lengths of 20 feet. That bottom picture there, I know that looks like an alligator or a crocodile, but that is actually more closely related to a frog today, one of those early amphibians. Now, eventually, they will evolve into reptiles at the end of the period, but this is the dominant life form. When we think about amphibians today, guys, we generally don't think frogs as being dominant. Well, they aren't, but they used to be, or their ancestors used to be the dominant life during the late Paleozoic. 
Now here, if you'll notice this picture, here is an early skeleton of one of these early amphibians in the foreground right here. The four that you see here in the background, these are all early reptiles that arise from these amphibians during the late Paleozoic. I want to talk about this guy right here, Dimetrodon. Here is a picture of what we think Dimetrodon looked like. Now, this is a very important group called Pelicosaurs, or finback reptiles. Now, if you look at the form, that picture on the bottom, you'll notice the sail. Paleontologists think that there were probably two purposes for that sail. Number one, since it was a reptile, remember reptiles today are what we call exothermic. Their body temperature is whatever the outside temperature is. And so during a cold morning, the Dimetrodon could point its sail towards the sun, soak up solar radiation quicker, and become active much more quicker than other reptiles. We also, or paleontologists also think, it may have been used in mating purposes. So it could flush blood in its sails. There were, there were small blood vessels within the, the skin, and it could probably change its color. So a male would flush blood into its sails, would darken the color to try and uh, to attract a female. The one, the males with the biggest, brightest sails were probably the ones that got to spread their DNA down the line. Remember we talked about that in Darwinian evolution. Survival of the fittest by means of natural selection. Now the reason I bring these pelicosaurs up is they are a very important group, guys. From the pelicosaurs, we will evolve the therapsids. Now, therapsids were reptiles, but they were mammal like reptiles. Why is this group so important? Well, guess where the true mammals evolved from? You got it, guys. The therapsids. They are our ancestors. Now, if you look at this tree of life down here, guys, here are the pelicosaurs right here. This group here. From that, we get a branch off where we get the therapsids, these mammal-like reptiles. Now, there were five very important evolutionary um, adaptations that the therapsids evolved to help them be much more successful than their earlier pelicosaur ancestors. Number one, we think they were endothermic. So while they look like reptiles, guys, endothermy, or often called hot-bloodedness, is what mammals have. We're endothermic animals. We are able to maintain a constant body temperature of 98 point, I always forget if it's 0.6 or 0.8. Always, always, always forget. But we're able to maintain that body temperature. It doesn't matter whether it's cold outside or hot outside, our bodies are at a constant temperature. So during the winter months, we have a much bigger advantage over reptiles. We can be active on a cold morning. Reptiles cannot. Other um, advantages is the eyes move further um, forward on the skull. Think about a crocodile, guys. Where are its eyes? On the top of its skull. Do you think this gives them a good line of sight? It does not. But us, our eyes are in the front of our skulls. We have what is called stereoscopic vision we can see a much wider range of vision. The legs are no longer sprawling. That word sprawling, guys, means that they're positioned, sprawling is the legs are positioned out to the sides. Once again, think of a crocodile. If you've ever seen a crocodile run, it's funny as hell. Unless it's running at you, then it's probably not so funny. But it's not a very efficient means of locomotion to have the legs out to the side. Well, look at you guys. You, your legs are underneath you. Much more efficient means of locomotion. Um, complex jaws with differentiated teeth. Think about, you have two major teeth in your mouth, guys. You have canines, which are used to rip and tear, and you have molars, which are used to grunt. Different teeth for different purposes. And then we start to see the development of the middle ear. This has nothing to do with hearing, guys. Your middle ear is used for balance. Generally, people that develop disorders of the middle ear develop vertigo. 
they have trouble uh, maintaining their balance. And so because our legs moved underneath us, now we have the middle ear to help us with our balance. The good news, guys, is all five of those evolutionary ad advantages of the Thrapsids, they pass down to the true mammals. We're endothermic, we have very good vision, we have, our legs are underneath us, we have complex jaws with differentiated teeth, and we have a complex middle ear. So all the good things that the Thrapsids evolved were passed down to the true mammals. Now, I want to talk about probably the most important advantage was this endothermy. Animals can be endothermic, warm-bloodedness. doesn't mean our blood is actually warm. It simply means we're able to maintain a constant body temperature. Reptiles, a crocodile for instance, is an exothermic animal. An exothermic animal means whatever their outside temperature is, is whatever their body temperatures will be. So reptiles can often be sluggish when it's very, very cold, or even sluggish when it's too warm. They can actually get overheated, okay? That's exothermic. So endothermic, much, uh, a great leap forward as far as evolution goes. Now, if you'll notice, we have three different therapsids on this picture. Here, here, and here. If you'll notice, the artist, what they did is they drew hair or fur. We think, or paleontologists think, that thrapsids may have been the first animals to develop hair to help regulate their body temperature. Think about what all mammals have in common, guys. We all have hair, some more than others, okay? But we all have hair. That helps us to maintain that constant body temperature we think therapsids may have been the first. Here is the therapsid family tree. If you look at the dentation, guys, the skulls on the left-hand side, these were probably herbivores, so primary consumers. And on the right, you'll notice the canines are overdeveloped. Those were probably carnivores or tertiary consumers. So therapsids, just like mammals, came in a wide variety of sizes and shapes. Now here are examples of the therapsids. If you take a look at these two pictures on the left hand side, here and here, these were early therapsids. Notice they look much closer to reptiles than they do to mammals. Notice that the legs are still sprawling. They're still out to the sides here, like a crocodile's are. So you'd expect early therapsids to, to look a lot more like reptiles. The pictures on the right are all later therapsids. And notice that looks much more mammalian, including the drawing of hair or fur. So even within the group of therapsids, we had major changes over tens of millions of years. Remember guys, evolution occurs slowly. Um, but fairly large changes just within this group itself. Um, Pangea. We've talked about Pangea already, guys, when we talked about plate tectonics, but we think during the later stages of the Paleozoic that Pangea comes together, maybe about 335 million years ago. It lasted all throughout the late Paleozoic into the Mesozoic, where it finally begins to break up about 175 million years ago. So Pangea was fairly long-lasting supercontinent. Now, it's, here's where we're on our journey, guys. So once again, here was the early Paleozoic, here was the middle, and here's where we are now. We're right here at the end of the late Paleozoic. This is where we have this largest extinction event of Earth's history. If you'll notice and compare this to the dinosaur extinction event, guys, it's not even close. Most people, when they, they think of extinction events, they always think of the Cretaceous extinction event, but it was much smaller than the Permian one. Now let's talk about the Permian extinction event, and that's what it's called, because it happened at the end of the Permian period in the late Paleozoic. It wiped out 80 to 85% of all species. It was particularly 
um, bad in the oceans, where 95% of marine species went extinct, including our trilobites, guys. Trilobites are gone. They were just hanging on by a thread anyway, but they're gone now. 70% of the land's reptile, amphibian, insect, and plant families, they go extinct. The amphibians, who were once dominant, they really get hit the hardest, guys. They will never recapture that dominance again. But notice insects are very hardy, guys. Insects are able to adapt to changing environments pretty well. The fact that it affected the insect community tells us that it was a very, very serious extinction event. Now, we think that it was triggered by volcanism. So as Pangaea begins to break apart, this may have triggered a very intense period of Earth's history of constant millions of years of unending volcanic eruptions. The reason we think this is in northern Eurasian continent, okay, we see this black dotted line. These are major lava flow deposits that have been radiometrically dated to have occurred right at the end of the Permian. So we think as Pangaea begins to break up, this triggers volcanism, which then triggered a very intense period of global warming. And so the largest extinction event in Earth's history, paleontologists think, were caused by climate change. Why should that worry us? Well, what are we seeing today, guys? Global warming, another intense period of global warming. So, we move into our next era, the Mesozoic. The entire Mesozoic is called the Age of Reptiles. So, Age of uh, Invertebrates, Age of Fishes, Age of Amphibians, now we're in Age of Reptiles. The early Mesozoic was from 251 to 199 million years ago. And it was that mass extinction event, guys that really wiped off the amphibians that allows the reptiles to come into power. We talked about this already, how evolutionary radiations were caused by an adaptive breakthrough or an extinction event. Well, here's another example of an extinction event. You wipe the slate clean of the dominant life, and this allows the next group to come into power, and when they do, they're going to experience an evolutionary radiation. Now, no dinosaurs yet, okay? which is why we call the Mesozoic the Age of Reptiles, not the Age of Dinosaurs. The dominant life during the early period are our marine reptiles. That top picture is an ichthyosaur. And our flying reptiles, called our pterosaurs. Most people think that flying reptiles were actually dinosaurs. No, they weren't. They were flying reptiles, not flying dinosaurs. We also see the appearance of our first crocodilian ancestors at this time, but they're much larger than their current counterparts. Now, here is what these early paleos, or I'm sorry, early Mesozoic seas must have looked like. And, and I know what your first instinct is. Oh, it's a whale and a school of dolphins. Nope. It's a large reptile with a school of smaller reptiles uh, swimming around it. We also, at this time, get our Mosasaurs. If you remember the movie Jurassic World, uh, the, the fourth movie, and you remember um, at the beginning, they had that big thing that came out of the lagoon and ate the, I think it was a killer whale. That was a Mosasaur, guys. And while Hollywood did take probably some um, ex exaggeration with that, Mosasaurs were incredibly large, powerful, scary tertiary consumers at this time. But they're in our oceans. So they're not terrestrial um, tertiary consumers. They would have been marine. We get our pterosaurs, our flying reptiles, uh, dominant at this time. And you'll... <coughs> excuse me. And you'll notice that a lot of them had brightly colored crests. If you take a look at this guy down here, this guy, all these crests. What do we think the purpose of those crests were, ladies and gentlemen? Well, 
Think about it today. Why do animals develop brightly colored, maybe plumage or body parts today? It is for attraction, so mating purposes. So once again, the males with the biggest, brightest colored crests were the ones that got the attention of the females. Now, we have no idea if these are the correct color schemes, but we look at life today, we look at the variety of colors in a lot of males today, and we infer that they were also brightly colored back then. Um, here is a very important group that doesn't get a lot of attention. These are the Thecodonts. These are these early reptiles that survived the Permian mass extinction event. So reptiles do survive the extinction event. They were wiped way down. But from these Thecodonts, eventually the dinosaurs will evolve. So this group is very important in that it's these early ancestors of dinosaurs. Eventually, thecodonts will evolve into dinosaurs much later. Here are crocodile ancestors. On the left, you see two of the earlier forms. I've always uh, had quite a lot of students tell me those kind of look like dragons, and I have to admit they kind of do. Um, these are some of the earlier forms. Now they will eventually evolve into this group called phytosaurs. These look a lot more like crocodiles do today, okay? but they were much bigger. Here's one of these phytosaur skulls, and from here, the snout to the back of the skull, it's probably about six feet. So much larger forms than we see crocodiles or alligators today. All right, let's move on to the middle and late Mesozoic. This is often called the age of dinosaurs. So while the entire Mesozoic is age of reptiles, the middle and late, this is where the dom dinosaurs are dominant. And this is the time that stretches from 199 to 65 million years ago. So over 130 million years of dominance the dinosaurs experienced. Um, over 9,000 species have been identified on every single continent, including Antarctica, guys. Antarctica was free of ice during the Mesozoic because um, it was much warmer than it is today. We think it may have been anywhere between 5 or 8 degrees Celsius warmer. So Antarctica was actually free of ice um, during the Mesozoic. Now, there are some other important things that happened we get our first flowering plants show up at the very, very later stages of the late Mesozoic. Remember our angiosperms. And we also see the appearance of our first birds. That picture on the lower left is Archaeopteryx. That was a very famous fossil found in the 1920s in Germany. And the reason why it's so important is you can see the impressions of feathers. Notice how on the rock you can see feathers. So Archaeopteryx, we think, showed up maybe 160 million years ago. And from Archaeopteryx, modern birds evolved. We also see our first mammals. Most people think that mammals don't show up until after the extinction of the dinosaurs. There is fossil evidence, ladies and gentlemen, that mammals predate the dinosaurs. So we actually have mammalian remains in the early Mesozoic. But what happened is that our early mammalian ancestors remained small burrowing creatures to essentially stay off the menu. So mammals and dinosaurs lived side by side for that entire time period, but we were just outcompeted. Darwin would say dinosaurs were better at competition than we were, and so we remained small, we remained burrowing, and we remained a limited number of different mammalian species, but we will get our day eventually, ladies and gentlemen. Now, I just wanted to look at some of the different dinosaur groups that uh, we have fossil evidence for. These are some of the earliest forms called the proceropods. So these actually stretch at the very end of the early Mesozoic into the middle Mesozoic. These are some of the earliest forms. Now, this next group, I'm sure you'll recognize, these are our theropods, our predatory dinosaurs. And probably the two that are most recognizable, that uh, upper left-hand picture is a T-Rex, Tyrannosaurus rex. 
and then we have our pack hunters, our velociraptors on the right. Um, probably um, uh, theropods ranged in size from about the size of a chicken, or a little bit smaller than a chicken actually, all the way up to, if you remember Jurassic Park 3 guys, you remember the dinosaur with the spine, Spinosaurus? That was one of the largest theropods, even a bigger than the T-Rex. So the T-Rex was a little bit smaller than some of those Spinosaurus. We had our herbivore dinosaurs, the seropods. Their biggest advantage was their immense size. If you take a look at this picture here, guys, this top left picture, these are three different species of seropods next to a full-grown man. So some of these may have reached 20, 25 feet in length from, from top of the head, neck, to the tail, and could have weighed 15, 20, maybe even 25 tons each. If you look at the picture on the right, their biggest advantage when going up against the predatory dinosaurs was their main size. Okay, If you look at this picture, guys, this seropod is going to win this battle. Okay, kind of like me taking on Mike Tyson in his prime. Okay, I'm the theropod. Mike Tyson is the big seropod. So we probably didn't see most theropods were smart enough not to take on an adult. And so they probably picked on juveniles or some of the older members of a herd because they were more easy prey. Theropods would be stupid to go up against a full-grown healthy adult male. It's not going to end well for the theropods, just like it's not going to end well for me against Mike Tyson. We had our ornithopods, our duck-billed dinosaurs. These came in, once again, a wide variety of crustal sizes and shapes. Once again, we think um, used for mating purposes. We also think that they could pass air through the crusts making some kind of noise to warn others in the herd uh, as far as maybe danger of nearby predators, maybe of letting them know where food was, but there was some kind of vocalization that these were able to do by passing air through these crests. Our next group are our armored dinosaurs, the ceratopsins. Ceratopsins evolved a a bony frill covering and protecting their neck and as you can see also some of them evolve some wicked looking horns on these frills. Probably the most well-known ceratopsins is Triceratops because one, two, three horns on his frill. So these actually evolve defensive and in some cases offensive protections from theropods. We also have Pachycephalosaurus. That's this guy that right down here. Pachycephalosaurus evolved a very unique skull in that it was 10 inches thick. And paleontologists think the purpose of this was during mating season, if two males were after the same females, what would happen is both males would lower their heads, kind of like um, your bighorn sheep do today, and they crash into each other over and over and over until one male relented. The winner would then get the female. This is proof that males have been doing stupid things for the attention of females for millions of years. This is not a new homo sapien thing, ladies and gentlemen. We also had other armored dinosaurs, our stegosaurs on the left, these guys evolved some wicked spikes on their tails, also for defensive purposes. And the ankylosaurs, which evolved a bony um, covering along their back and a wicked looking club on their tail. Once again, a theropod gets too close, you swing the tail and break some bones. Now, originally, paleontologists thought that the plates on the backs of our stegosaurs were also used for defensive purposes, but it really doesn't make much sense. We now think that they were used for thermoregulation, just like the back that um, fin for our Dimetrodon. During a cold morning, 
a stegosaur would point its plates to the sun, heat up more solar radiation, and therefore become active much more quicker. Now, dinosaurs were the dominant life until the end of the Cretaceous, where we have another extinction event that occurred about 65 million years ago. Now, this is much more selective than the Permian mass extinction. So, wiping out about 50 to 60 percent of plant and animal species. But it was, once again, much more selective. Reptiles survive, amphibians survive, but dinosaurs, gone. Marine reptiles, gone. Flying reptiles, gone. But other reptiles, like turtles and snakes and crocodiles, they survive. So, much more selective event. It, it chose the larger reptilian dinosaurs, but left the smaller reptile forms. They were able to come through. Not unscathed, but they were still able to survive. Now, um, the most widely accepted mechanism for this uh, extinction event is an impact event. And we have several pieces of evidence for this. The first one is in the early 80s. A father and son paleontologist team discovered a impact crater here in the Yucatan Peninsula. We dated it, and once again, it occurred at the end of the Cretaceous. So what would happen is a asteroid or meteorite hits the Earth, and it creates nuclear winter. So it would throw up tremendous amounts of dust and ash into the atmosphere, where those would remain for years. So the dust blocks the sunlight, the plants die because they can't perform photosynthesis without sunlight. The primary consumers die, secondary die, tertiary die. It creates a total collapse of our ecological pyramid. This is often what we would we call nuclear winter. It's exactly what would happen to us if we decided to let fly the nuclear weapons that we have today. Now another piece of evidence is we have tsunami deposits. Remember we've talked about tsunamis earlier on, that ringing around the Gulf of Mexico, so from Florida all the way into Mexico and Central America, we get these tsunami deposits. So as this asteroid hit, you'll notice a portion of it hit in the ocean. This would have triggered those tsunami waves, which would have washed up um, all along the Gulf of Mexico. Um, iridium layer. This brown layer that you see here, iridium is a, uh, an element. Very rare on Earth, but it's very common in extraterrestrial bodies. So as the asteroid or meteorite hit the Earth, it would have disintegrated, thrown up all this dust, which would have been enriched in iridium, and as it settled back down. So in parts of the world where we see this Cretaceous or, or this um, Mesozoic, Cenozoic boundary, we get this enrichment of iridium. We also get something called shock quartz. That's that lower picture there. This is quartz that has been deformed. Quartz is the most common mineral on the Earth's surface. Shock quartz is something that's been deformed due to high pressures and high temperatures, something that would have been triggered by an impact event. So we leave the age of reptiles and we enter the age of mammals the Cenozoic era which includes the last 65 million years we are still in the Cenozoic era today now this is known as the age of mammals so even though other forms survive the Cretaceous extinction event birds small reptiles fish they're not the dominant life Mammals took over the dominance from the dinosaurs and have remained so uh, for all those 65 million years. Now, we will also see something interesting happen as far as climate goes. The Mesozoic was a very warm time period, which is why reptiles were so successful. Higher temperatures, and remember, mammals, or I'm sorry, reptiles are exothermic. So warmer temperatures are right in their wheelhouse. Well, over the last 65 million years, we've seen an overall decrease in temperatures, which has led to um, something called glacial periods. We're going to talk more about this when we get to climate change. But glacial periods are time where the temperatures are much cooler 
and glaciers, large bodies of ice, expand. And so over the last 65 million years, we have had times where the temperature has been low enough to support big bodies of ice uh, on continental masses. And here is the evolutionary radiation of the mammals. So here's the boundary right here, guys. This is the Mesozoic. This is the Cenozoic. So you'll notice we think we get our start. They say in the middle Mesozoic, there's actually fossil evidence to suggest that mammals show up about right here in the late early Mesozoic or in the Triassic period. And so once again, had to remain small to stay off the menu here but now that dinosaurs are gone, we have this evolutionary radiation of the mammals. Now, some groups had 20, 25 million years of dominance, and then they go extinct. But notice current mammals like rhinos, elephants, whales, our big apes, bats, big cats, they all get their start relatively early and have been evolving over that last 65 million years. Now, as of right now, this is the earliest fossil evidence of a mammalian ancestor that we have. So this comes from the late Triassic. The Triassic is the first period in the Mesozoic. So at the very end of the early Mesozoic, before the dinosaurs, we think this guy shows up. And you'll notice it looks like a small shrew or rat or mouse or something along those lines. Um, here are some early marsupial forms on the left-hand side. Marsupials are, are mammals that have those pouches. So kangaroos, wombats, uh, what's another marsupial? Uh, I think koala bears are marsupials, aren't they? I think they are. So early forms on the left, on the right hand side, we have some of our earliest primates. Eventually those will evolve into modern monkeys. Now here is the evolution of the whales. Yes, I said whales, ladies and gentlemen. This top picture is an early whale ancestor. Remember when we were talking about evolution and we talked about vestigial organs? Whales have a pelvis, which is completely useless to them today. But if you look at some of these early whale forms here, these were terrestrial animals. We don't know why, but they started off on land. And for them, they would have needed a pelvis. Somewhere around here, and once again, we don't know why, but the whales moved into a marine environment. And so if you look at this, this intermediate member here, I always look at this picture and think, oh, it's a swimming mole. Nope, it's an intermediate whale, ladies and gentlemen, somewhere right around in here. This guy was about 30, lived about 30 million years ago. And you'll see, just over about 30 million years of evolution, whales change dramatically from a purely terrestrial animal to now living in a purely marine environment. Now, for my in-class uh, lectures, I put this slide up to um, let my students know that, remember we talked about phonetics and cladistics. Phonetics is classifying based on what an animal looks like, and cladistics is classifying based on the tree of life. Well, what I have is four mammals, and I always ask my kids um, which, or what animals do you think these eventually evolved into? So let's take this upper left-hand picture. This is Andrew Sarkis, guys. And I always ask my kids, well, what do you think this evolved into? And I always get the answers, oh, wolves and lions or maybe bears. Believe it or not, this guy will evolve into pigs and sheep. And the reason I do this exercise, guys, remember, does physical appearance tell you anything about common ancestry? Does not. Okay. This guy right here, he actually looks a, a lot more closer than what he actually evolved into. This guy evolves into rhinos that we see today. This guy 
And if you look at the skin texture, you might be able to understand what this guy will evolve into. This will evolve into rhinos. So actually, believe it or not, okay, both of these are ancestors to rhinos. This is an earlier form. This is a later form. And so quite a big difference. This guy right here is actually a ancestor to elephants. Looks a little bit closer. But the key point here, guys, is remember, physical appearance doesn't tell you anything about common ancestry. Here's another picture that I dub life is ironic. This is a flightless bird, a carnivorous flightless bird. Um, is an early ancestor to ostriches today, but he's eating an early horse. So this guy was probably about six feet tall, this bird, and he's eating Eohippus, one of the earliest horses that were probably about the size of a house cat. So you have a bird eating a horse. Here are some of the later mammalian forms. This is a very famous fossil that is found in the Chicago um, Museum of Natural History. This is a giant ground sloth. And I've stood right next to this um, fossil. I come up right up to about his pelvis. So you're talking about maybe 10 to 12 feet in height. These, um, this is a woolly rhino, which will eventually evolve into our modern rhinos. This is an ancestor of deer and elk. And this is Clyptodon. He will eventually evolve into armadillos, but much, much bigger than modern armadillos. Here are some more of these mam um, early mammals. I, I'm sorry, late mammals. These were around during the last ice age, which lasted from about 2 million years ago to about 10,000. So over the last 10,000 years, we've actually been in a warming phase. So we have our uh, woolly mammoth and mastodon. We have our um, bears. Short, this is a short-faced bear relative of, of black bears and Kodiak bears and grizzly bears. We have our dire wolves, a little bit bigger than modern wolves. And then our saber tooth. Everybody wants to say saber tooth tiger. It's actually not a tiger, it's a cat. Saber tooth cat that evolved these nine inch wicked looking canines, once again for ripping and tearing. Now, there's one mammal that we haven't talked about, and so I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about human evolution. Somewhere between six and eight million years ago, we split off from the evolutionary line of apes. So apes keep going on their path, we split off on a brand new path that will eventually lead to us. Now, kind of this intermediate form between monkeys and our homo genus was this group called Australopithecines. Okay? They're going to have characteristics of both apes and of humans, or what will eventually become humans. And so one of the earliest forms, you can actually see here on the right, um, this is one of the earliest forms of these Australopithecines that we have dated somewhere between six and seven million years ago. And from this skull, we've been able to reconstruct what they look like. Now, if you look at this and go, does that look more monkey or more man? I hope the answer doesn't surprise you. More monkey, right? We had just split, in, we had just split off from the evolutionary line of apes. So these Australopithecines are gonna look a lot more like apes than they are humans. Now, these Australopithecines um, were the early forms were really pretty small okay think of a chimpanzee some of the early um, australopithecines were a little bit bigger than a chimpanzee and they actually grew bigger as they went along now if you look at it um, if you look at the left hand side you look at the skull and look at the skeletal structure australopithecines shared a lot of common features with chimps uh, and apes in that they had elongated uh, forelimbs which were great for climbing and once again that skull looks much more ape-like than it does human-like. 
Eventually, from these Australopithecines, our Homo genus evolves right around 2.4 million years ago in South and East Africa. The interesting thing about this, guys, is then Australopithecines disappear from the fossil record about 2 million years ago. So there was about a 0.4 million years of overlap. What Darwin would say about that is that the Homo, our earliest Homo members, were able to outcompete these Australopithecines, and we caused their extinction. Now, this reconstruction here on the right of one of an intermediate form of Australopithecines, uh, this is Australopithecus afriensis. If you've ever heard of the famous fossil called Lucy, this was the species of Lucy. Now, I don't like how they have it positioned. So you'll notice it has it walking up on two legs. Well, the Australopithecines, just like monkeys, apes, were quadrupedal. They walked on all fours. So if you'll notice that, look at their forelimbs. It looks a little bit longer than ours. That's because they were. They were good climbers, but they were also fastest when they were on all fours. If you've ever seen a gorilla run, he doesn't run upright. He runs on all fours. So Australopithecines were quadrupedal. It's going to take a while before we develop walking on all twos. Now from these early forms, we evolved one of the first and most successful members of our genus, Homo habilis, which means handyman. This guy lived from about 2.4 million years ago to about 1.4 million years ago in Eastern and South Africa. This is where w w why we call Africa the cradle of life. Because this is where Australopithecines split off from the apes, and this is where our, our genus eventually evolved. Now, this was actually the oldest member of our genus until about 10 years ago, when we actually discovered something that was older, um, this form. But this guy wasn't as successful. I mean, a million years, that's pretty successful, guys. Now, from one of these earliest uh, craniums, we were able to reconstruct what we think Homo habilis looked like. And once again, you'll notice that looks more like a, a chimp than it does a human. And once again, you'd expect our early Homo members to look more ape-like or more chimp-like than they do us. Now, eventually, Homo habilis evolves into Homo erectus. And Homo erectus means to set upright. This is the first member that we think was bipedal, that walked on its back two legs. So Homo habilis, just like monkeys, were probably quadrupedal. Now this guy lived from about 1.8 million years ago to 150,000. So he was actually even more successful than Homo habilis. Now, here's the interesting thing. A lot of anthropologists have found evidence that there was crossbreeding. So, as soon as Homo habilis shows up, there is evidence that they were having sex with Australopithecines and producing offspring. Not fertile offspring, but offspring nonetheless. There's also evidence, guys, that Homo erectus was breeding with Homo habilis because there was that overlap. Now, if you, if you wonder how we draw the line between different members of our species, I'm sorry, different members of our genus, is two things. The craniums, which is the empty space here in the skull, guys. Here's your cranium. gets bigger. What can we infer from that? Well, bigger craniums means bigger brain. And we infer that means they're getting smarter. And the tools become much more elaborate. So when making distinctions between members of our genus, this is what we use. Cranium size and um, tools being much more elaborate. There is also evidence that Homo erectus was the first to use fire, not only to stay warm, but there is evidence that it was able to cook its food using fire. Now, if you notice this Homo erectus skull, guys, if you ignore the cranial ridge, which we do not have anymore, 
and you look at the two orbital sockets, the nasal cavity, and the dentition, this, if you were to erase that, that cranial ridge, looks kind of like our skulls today. And from this, they were able to reconstruct what Homo erectus looks like, and now we're starting to see much more man-like features. Eventually, we give rise to Homo sapiens, our species. Sapiens, if you didn't know, means wise or knowing. I think we are the worst named species ever. You look at, at what's happening in the world. Um, I usually just look at keeping up with the Kardashians to let me truly understand we are really not that smart, ladies and gentlemen. Now, sapiens, they show up about 250,000 years ago. We're a relatively young species, guys only been around for a quarter of a million years. We still see the craniums get bigger, so we infer that means bigger brain, and the tolls once again become much more elaborate, which gives credence that we're getting smarter. Now, I also want to point out something we talked about in evolution. Remember Cope's rule? We said that body size increases during your evolution process. Well, humans follow Cope's rules. If you'll notice the two skeletal structures, the one on the left is a Homo erectus, the one on the right is a Homo, sa is a homo sapien. You'll notice that not only are we getting taller, and by the way, the trend continues from habilis to erectus to sapien, not only is our height increasing, but our skeletal girth is increasing, which is why we, humans, along with horses, are great examples of species that have followed Cope's rule. Now, here is human evolution. This is kind of a summary. Everything you see up here in orange, guys, these are our Austra Australopithecines. So here was the oldest one that I showed you. It shows up somewhere between 6 and 7 million years ago. Now, you'll notice there's some that are pretty successful, some that come and go in a blink of an eye. Here is that um, Lucy, Australopithecus afriensis. He was a mid an intermediate member. And then here are the green. Here's our Homo ancestry. Here's Homo habilis, Homo erectus. Uh, I know you guys have heard of Neanderthals. That would be here. Uh, and then us here at Homo sapiens. Um, whether we're successful or not, most days I have my doubts um, whether we're going to be really a successful species or not. Now, I always like to end this discussion with this slide kind of a summary of what we've been talking about. Think about when we started our Life Through Time discussion. What's the first thing we talked about? The beginning of everything. The Big Bang. 14.7, I'm sorry, 13.7 billion years ago. Then we talked about the, um, our origin of our solar system, the solar nebula hypothesis. And after that, we have been slowly talking about the history of Earth. When life began, we talked about the Precambrian, and today, during this lecture, we've been talking about here's the age of the invertebrates, the age of fishes, the age of amphibians, the age of reptiles, and the age of mammals. If you were to compress all of Earth's 4.6 billion years into one calendar year, we don't show up until five minutes before midnight on December 31st, guys. We're always bragging. We think we're this pinnacle of evolution. We're not. We have been here but a blink of an eye. Now, this is the end of our life through time discussion. Um, what I like to include is because there was no reading assignment. Essentially, this was this is what we call historical geology, guys, looking at how life has changed through time. For your second exam, what I will do is give you a study guide to help you kind of keep fresh when things happened throughout geologic history.